Hello everyone. Very good afternoon to all. Welcome to today's webinar on formation and oxidative aging of secondary organic aerosols using potential aerosol mass oxidation flow reactor. In short, it is called PAM. I'm Satya Narayana uh, from Tescon Aerofluid Incorporated in Bangalore. Our company for over 25 years has been providing research instruments and technical support for instrumentation, which are used for atmospheric sciences, aerosol size and chemistry, black carbon, and measurement of specific meteorological variables. We are located in India, Singapore, Turkey, and USA. Currently, our instruments have been used in various campaigns to measure aerosol mass and size distribution, airborne particle studies, atmospheric trace gases, clouds and radiation. Also, we continue to expand our atmospheric instrumentation and real-time monitoring capabilities. I would like to introduce to you today's presenter, Dr. Andrew Lambe. He is a senior research scientist at Center for Aerosol and Cloud Chemistry, Aerodyne Research Incorporated, USA. Dr. Andrew will provide an overview of how PAM generates secondary organic aerosol from the oxidation of precursors and also how it can be used to characterize particle, chemical, physical, and optical properties over simulated photochemical aging timescales. During the session, if you have any questions, then please put it in to the chat box. At the end of this session, we will have a question and answer session. We will try to cover all your questions in that. If you are facing poor video or audio quality, please click on the reconnect tab, which is at the top of the window. You can watch our previously conducted webinar recordings in the blog section of our official website. Thank you again for uh, joining us. I request Dr. Andrew to start the session. Over to Dr. Andrew. Thank you, Satya, for the introduction. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you about uh, my company, Aerodyne, and our, our research. Uh, and let me just start by saying that my email address is here. Uh, if you're interested, you can send me an email afterwards and I'll send you the slides. There's no need to take screenshots or notes while I'm talking unless you'd like to. Um, and with that, I'll begin. Uh, so an outline for my talk, I'll start with a, a background as an introduction to, to Aerodyne, for those of you who may not be familiar. Um, and then I'll introduce the concept of oxidation flow reactors, or OFRs, before I get into some of the specific discussions of the PAM OFR. Uh, and then I will show some select laboratory and field applications of OFRs to give you a sense of how they can be used to gain insight into sources and aging of, of SOA in the atmosphere and in the lab. Uh, so just to start a brief introduction to Aerodyne, uh, we are a small company that was founded in 1970 and is located in the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. Uh, we have about 70 scientists and support staff in our company. When we were originally founded, we were mostly a defense contractor, but we have since evolved over the last 50 years to a company that now does research and development uh, of instruments as well as consulting services. And we have five research centers today. Uh, I am in the Air Center for Aerosol and Cloud Chemistry, which is the largest group at Aerodyne, but there are many other active and thriving research centers um, in our company also, including some that make instruments, uh, such as the Center for Atmospheric and Environmental Chemistry and the Center for Sensor Systems and Technology that have delivered instruments to, to India. Uh, our previous president was Chuck Kolb, who sadly passed away early last year, and our current president is Dave Nelson. Uh, to date, we've delivered, uh, with Descorn's help, uh, more than 17 research instruments to India, to the six groups that I've shown at the bottom. Uh, and we hope that this is the start of a continuing uh, collaboration with research groups in India that will continue to grow over time. Uh, we have delivered instruments to IAT Comper, IISC, PRL, the VSSC, IATM Pune, and IAT Delhi. Um, 
The instrument that Aerodyne is best known for is our aerosol mass spectrometer. Uh, this is an instrument that can provide a real-time chemical fingerprint of suspended aerosols in the air uh, through a, a high-resolution time-of-flight aerosol mass spectrometer. It can also provide sizing information uh, of, of organics and inorganic ions such as ammonium, chloride, sulfate, and nitrate. Uh, and it can do this in time scales of one to five minutes under typical atmospheric loadings. Uh, another very similar instrument, but more of a monitoring uh, type instrument instead of a research instrument is our aerosol chemical speciation monitor. And this has been the instrument that we've delivered uh, most to India to, to this point, to the groups shown below. Uh, and so it, it serves a similar purpose that it measures the chemical fingerprint of suspended aerosols in the air uh, under one micron in diameter or under two, mi two and a half microns in diameter, depending on the configuration of the instrument. Uh, the major differences being that it has unit mass resolution, uh, unlike the AMS, which can resolve um, to much better than one uh, unit mass, uh, and it does not provide sizing information. Um, but it's, it's used routinely, and it is the most, the most the instrument that we delivered most to India to date. Uh, we've also delivered a VOCUS proton transfer reaction mass spectrometer, which can be used to measure VOCs and OVOCs uh, with high sensitivity and high time resolution in the air. And it can be coupled to a gas chromatograph to get um, isomer specific uh, information about VOCs and OVOCs. Uh, we have delivered three cavity attenuated phase shift uh, analyzers that are configured in different ways to either measure the aerosol extinction, the aerosol extinction and scattering, uh, or it can be configured to, as a gas phase analyzer to measure NO2 mixing ratios in the air. Uh, and then finally, what will be the focus of the talk today, we have delivered one PAM oxidation flow reactor to the group in Delhi. Uh, and as with, all, with, with that instrument and with all these, as I said, we hope that this is going to continue to grow into the future through uh, research collaborations with, with groups in India and government and universities and, and so on. This figure shows uh, AMS measurements of aerosol composition in uh, measurement sites around India, uh, in Delhi, Kanpur, uh, Chennai, and uh, I'm going to not pronounce the last ones correctly, so I won't try. Um, but I, I would imagine that a lot of you are, are familiar with this paper by Gunthal that summarizes this information in the context of discussing uh, high aerosol chloride concentrations in the aerosol, uh, which are shown by the purple pie charts in these graphs. Uh, and that's the focus of that talk, but it, this, this figure, I think, also nicely lays out some of the, um, the general trends that are observed in aerosol composition that motivate some of the research goals that I'll talk about today. The main one being that um, all of these, uh, these, these subcomponents of, of non-refractory submicron aerosol, chloride, sulfate, nitrate, ammonium, and organics are all present and are all important in different source regions. You see that this green one, the organics, uh, is always the dominant component uh, uh, of these aerosols. It's always at least 50% and in some cases approaches 80%. Um, and we tend to see that elsewhere in the world also, that, that organics are always, if, if not are, are often, if not always, uh, the major component uh, of submicron aerosols that is me measured by the AMS. Um, organic, within that though, the, the context though, the organics are really complex, they're tens, there are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of individual molecules, uh, and they come fr from primary sources as well as uh, our secondary of nature being formed in the atmosphere from gas to particle conversion processes. Uh, and this, this figure illustrates that the dynamic nature of the primary to secondary split in India, um, where depending on the time of year, the time of day, uh, and the source region, you can have uh, primary organics that are the dominant component of that organic, uh, that organic component to aerosols, uh, approaching 80%, shown on the on the top right in subpanel F, uh, or approaching 0% uh, during the middle of the day when photochemical activity is highest, and uh, there's significant co contributions from secondary air organic aerosols that are being formed from the oxidation of gaseous precursors. Uh, so this lends the question, what are the precursors to OA, which we often use interchangeably with SOA because it's, it's the, the major component of OA, uh, and how do we gain insight into the, the contribution of 
those different precursors to the organic aerosols that are being measured in the air. Uh, traditionally, this has been, uh, these types of field observations have been summarized, have been, excuse me, have been supplemented by complementary studies in the lab where research groups have used environmental chambers to introduce uh, simple SOA precursors or mixtures of, v of fixed VOCs that are thought to be important SOA precursors and study their formation and aging over time scales of, of multiple hours to in some cases approaching days of real time oxidative aging in the chambers. Uh, the state of the art environmental chambers can, can mimic one or two days uh, of equivalent aging time in the atmosphere in the lab uh, with these large batch reactors that are, that are used to study these processes. Uh, these are the, the most established method for laboratory SOA generation. They've been used for a long time uh, and they're widely accepted around the world uh, as, the, as the most common means to do this. Uh, so they have a lot of advantages and a lot of great research has been done with them, but they have some disadvantages that sometimes limit their applications in practical situations. Uh, including some that I've summarized on this bottom bullet point here, uh, that in general chambers, because they're so large, they're extremely resource intensive to maintain. Uh, they're relatively slow. It takes a day or multiple days to do a single experiment. Um, and as with any large reactor volume, um, they are sometimes prone to contamination issues and um, over time, wall losses of, of particles and gases uh, that can uh, you know, complicate the interpretation of some experiments. Uh, more recently than chambers, uh, oxidation flow reactors or OFRs have been starting to be developed and introduced into the atmospheric chemistry community uh, as a means to complement and extend the capabilities of environmental chambers, uh, both for laboratory SOA generation and also in situ uh, oxidative aging leading to SOA formation um, in field measurements, uh, where it's not always uh, where it's not always practical to deploy smog chambers. Uh, unlike smog chambers, unlike most smog chambers, OFRs are, are operated in a continuous flow mode where uh, a carrier gas of air uh, and then trace levels of precursors to OVOCs and SOA are, are always introduced uh, at the inlet along with precursors to making specific oxidants like hydroxyl radical uh, or nitrate radical or, or other oxidants are, are, co are continuously introduced and the steady state distribution of oxidation products is measured at the outflow uh, with whatever measurement techniques are being used. Uh, and so the fundament, one of the fundamental differences between uh, chambers and OFRs is that in chambers, you're doing experiments that take hours to days to simulate uh, days of equivalent aging time in the atmosphere. Whereas in OFRs, uh, these are done in timescales of minutes. So it's a semi real time uh, measurement of the OVOC or SOA formation potential of uh, precursors that are present in ambient air if it's being used in the field, or of the precursors that are being introduced in the lab if it's, if it's a lab study. Uh, the PAM OFR is the OFR that I'll be talking more specifically about uh, in this presentation, but you should be aware that this is one of many OFRs that now exist in the community. These are often custom home-built instruments. They span almost a, as wide a range uh, of volume as do chambers, uh, with the smallest that I've chosen to show here, the microsmog chamber, uh, a volume of less than 0.1 liters to the largest, the photochemical emissions and aging reactor made by a group in Finland that is about 140 liters. So four orders of magnitude and volume for OFRs. But the, the, the characteristic that they all generally share is that they're trying to mimic days of equivalent aging time in minutes uh, or, or less than a minute in, in within the residence time of the OFR here. How are oxidants generated in OFRs? Um, they all vary slightly differently in terms of the details of how this is accomplished, but the main uh, network of reactions that used to generate hydroxyl radical, which is what OFRs are most commonly used for, uh, is shown here. Um, so hydroxyl radicals, which are the main oxidizing agents in most source regions during the daytime, are generated from starting with oxygen, uh, which is photolyzed at 185 nanometer radiation uh, either external to the OFR to make ozone in a separate ozone chamber or in situ to generate ozone and then photolyze it at 254 nanometers to make OH radicals uh, from reaction of O-singlet D atoms with, with water vapor, which is the main source of OH in the stratosphere and in many lower parts of the troposphere also. 
Uh, along with that, um, if the 185 nanometer radiation is, is used inside the OFR itself, you get additional uh, OH and a HO2 production from direct photolysis of water vapor itself. And then if the experiment is trying to look at um, specific NOx dependent chemistry, uh, one can add nitrous oxide to photolyze at 185 nanometers uh, to make uh, O-sing with D-atoms, uh, which then react with N2O to make NO. Uh, and N2O can also react with O-sing with D that's formed from ozone photolysis to make NO as well, which with the ozone that's already present results in a steady state uh, distribution of NO and NO2 uh, for NOx dependent studies in the OFR. Um, other oxidants that can be used and that are being used um, include ozone, which is already present for OH generation, uh, but can be used in dark ozonolysis conditions, uh, nitrate radicals to look at the nighttime photochemical aging uh, of VOCs and OVOCs, uh, as well as chlorine and bromine uh, to look at the influence of halogen atoms. Uh, so these, these techniques are all in various stages of development, and I won't be talking about them in detail today, um, but just be aware that those are additional systems that can be used to, to study SOA and formation and aging in OFRs. Uh, so how does this work in practice? Uh, well, as I mentioned, the OFRs are operated in steady state, uh, continuous flow mode, uh, unlike uh, most environmental chambers, which are operated in batch mode. And so what happens in practice is, um, this is an example time series of OFR data from the PAM OFR, where over time, we're stepping through different uh, steady state conditions. Uh, here on the top is the irradiance, which is proportional to the UV intensity. So we're changing the intensity of the, the, the UV photons in the OFR to change the rate at which uh, hydroxyl radical is generated and the amount of aging time that's formed. Uh, so here we're stepping down and there we're stepping up just to illustrate the, how that works. Um, but each of these steady state periods can be maintained indefinitely if the user wants. Here, I'm just doing it every few minutes to, to illustrate a typical uh, measurement, res measurement resolution that might be done in the field. Uh, in this case, we have 185 and 254 nanometer photons inside the OFR. So, we, so ozone is correlated with the UV intensity. Uh, when there's more UV, we're photolyzing oxygen more efficiently, we're making more ozone. Uh, but then when we step down the lamp intensity, the ozone concentration goes down, and then it goes back up with the UV intensity. Uh, and so you can see that uh, you know, with, with under typical conditions, we're generating tens of ppm uh, of ozone to generate uh, days or, or weeks of equivalent uh, aging time skills with, by hydroxyl radical. Um, and here, this time series shows SO2, which we've introduced as a reactive tracer, uh, which can be used to, which is, is one way to infer the OH concentrations that are being made. If you have, this is called the tracer decay method, if you have a species with a known reaction rate coefficient with OH, you can measure its decay, and from the kinetic uh, rate equations that govern its formation and its oxidation, you can um, calculate the, the integrated OH exposure or the photochemical age uh, using this type of method. And you can see that when the, the UV concentration and the ozone concentration are the highest, the SO2 concentration is lowest because this is where the OH concentration is, um, is, is maximized. But then when we back off the, the UV intensity and we're making less OH, the SO2 concentration approaches what it was before we turn the lights on. Uh, another tool that has, the, has been developed to, to more comprehensively characterize OFR conditions uh, in the PAM OFR as well as other OFRs that use the same photochemistry uh, uh, is this open source uh, photochemical box model so it was developed by Bill Brune at Penn State, who introduced the PAM concept that I'll be talking about in a couple of slides, uh, and that has been refined uh, by other groups over the last few years. Uh, and I don't intend to go through every reaction that's shown here, but just to illustrate that there's a lot of reactions that govern, uh, that describe the formation and the decay of individual radicals, uh, including OH, but not limited to OH, and where this complements this, the type of tracer decay methods that I showed on the previous slide to infer OH concentrations are that here you can you can model the concentrations of radicals that are um, that are that are you know really not possible to measure in any straightforward manner such as O singlet D uh, or, or or other really short lived radical species. So this complements uh, explicit measurements of OH concentrations, um, 
but by giving you a more uh, comprehensive picture of what's happening in the OFR under different conditions. Uh, and so that's nice, but that's uh, that ty that type of model representation is not really possible to do uh, in real time while measurements are being made. And so it serves a useful analysis purpose, but is not quite as useful as a uh, an online real time diagnostic purpose. Uh, we and others in the community have also developed what are called estimation equations that are simplified algebraic representations of the model um, of a range of conditions. Uh, that are summarized in this equation that we developed um, in a technical note recently. And so this equation allows the user to parameterize the OH exposure as a function of the external OH reactivity of VOCs that are being added, uh, the ozone mixing ratio, the humidity, uh, and the resonance time. And what put into practice, uh, within a factor of two or so, over several orders of magnitude, this uh, equation estimated OH exposure uh, agrees with the, the OH exposure that is calculated by the model using the network of reactions as shown on the previous slide uh, within about a factor of two or so. Uh, and so to give you a sense of scale for these large numbers that you're looking at here, um, one day of, uh, of OH exposure in the atmosphere is about 10 to the 11 molecules per cubic centimeter, per, per molecules per cubic centimeter second, which is in the mid range of this plot, so this is looking at aging time scales that range from much less than a day uh, to much more than a day. Um, so uh, yeah, this, this complements the model and it complements the, the situations where you can measure the exp exposure by giving you a sense of where in the photochemical regime you are, are operating with the OFR at any given time. Uh, so now that I've introduced some of the, the general terminology and concepts around uh, OFRs, I want to talk a little bit more specifically about the, the PAM OFR. Um, this specific technique was introduced by Bill Brune, professor at Penn State, who introduced the concept uh, almost 15 years ago now in a paper in ACP, where they defined PAM for a precursor as the maximum aerosol mass that the oxidation of that precursor can produce. Um, and they demonstrated proof of concept uh, of PAM using SO2 as a precursor to sulfuric acid and showed quantitative uh, conversion of SO2 to sulfuric acid over a range of SO2 concentrations uh, in the early generation PAM reactor. Uh, and so this was the, the, the con this was the framework that Brune's group uh, introduced uh, where they used an OFR to achieve the potential aerosol mass for SO2 and then other organic precursors uh, that motivated follow-up studies in the community. Uh, but it turns out that while the concept of PAM is straightforward for inorganics like S2 that only have a single oxidation product, the interpretation of that is, is more nuanced for organics, which, uh, which make many oxidation products and whose composition is dynamic over a range of photochemical aging conditions. And I showed one example of that here, where I'm showing the yield of SOA formed from alpha pinene, which is one of the most commonly studied biogenic uh, VOC precursors. Uh, to, to SOA. Here you can see that the yield increases at low OH exposure, increases as we uh, produce multifunctional low volatility products, and then decreases again as these uh, very low volatility multifunctional oxidation products that uh, contribute to alpha pinene and SOA are fragmented to make more aged but more volatile uh, SOA. So the PAM concept um, by the by the def the strict definition of the PAM uh, uh, term that I in introduced on the previous slide, the, the PAM for alpha pinene would be here, but depending on where the OFR is being operated, uh, it's, it's, it's not a static quantity anymore, and we have to be careful how we apply that, 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 that term. But that being said, the operating principles of the PAM and other OFRs hold as a as a tool to 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 still study um, photochemical tie bills that ex that extend and complement what chambers can do, especially in the field. Uh, and so to illustrate that, um, this slide shows the elemental composition of two types of biogenic SOA that are generated in one of the state of the art uh, uh, smog chambers, the Caltech chamber, um, and the the Paul Scherer Institute chamber, uh, 
these, these squares here. Um, this graph shows the hydrogen to carbon ratio and the oxygen to carbon ratio of the SOAs as measured by our AMS. Um, and you can see that for the case of isoprene, we are, the OFR is being used to significantly extend the range of oxidation conditions in both directions, not just in the, the more oxidized direction. Um, for isoprene SOA, we evolved towards much higher O to C and lower H to C as it's chewed up over multiple generations of, of oxidative aging. Uh, and then also with alpha pinene SOA, uh, we're uh, generally following the same trend as uh, alpha pinene SOA in the chambers as it evolves, uh, and then extending it out further towards higher ancient conditions that are uh, you know, comparable to multiple days of, of uh, equivalent atmospheric aging. Uh, what, aside from its specific geometry and hardware uh, and control uh, systems, uh, probably the, the, the most distinct distinguishing factor of the PAM OFR compared to other OFRs is that we have been developing it and manufacturing it and delivering it to, to users all over the world for the last five years or so in collaboration with Bill Bruin, who came to us uh, with, with interest in co-developing this technique. Uh, so all the other designs that I summarized in an earlier slide are mostly custom home-built configurations. Here, uh, we have established a community that uses basically the same technique as we have with the AMS and ACSM and all of our other research instruments um, uh, around the world so that everyone is using basically the same hardware and doesn't have to develop that. It can just instead focus on it uh, using the OFR for its specific applications. Um, and so Bill delivered several of the, of the early generation PAM OFRs. Um, those are the blue markers on this slide, and those are primarily in the US and in Europe. Uh, after we took over the manufacturing and delivering uh, components of the PAM OFR, uh, we continued to deliver to the US uh, and also to Europe, but more recently, uh, most of the, the deliveries have been uh, in China and elsewhere in, in Asia. Um, and very recently, um, we, we with Tescor, and we have delivered uh, a system to uh, Dr. Kumar's group in IIT Delhi. Um, and so they um, have had the perspective of developing it uh, over the last few months as a new group. Um, but as it turns out, the first system that we delivered uh, was to Dr. Chakrabarty at WashU St. Louis in the US, um, who I mention here because I, as is probably evident from his name, he's from India, and I know that he maintains active research collaborations uh, with many groups in India. Um, so I'm hopeful that um, and I think there's a lot of untapped potential to use the o OFRs uh, for, for, for uh, atmospheric sciences research uh, in India and elsewhere. Um, so what are, some of the, what are some of the ways that OFRs can be used to, to gain more insight into SOA chemistry uh, in India? Um, I adapted this slide from my colleague by Yost Degao, Degao at CU Boulder who was uh, speaking in China uh, a few years ago and was trying to motivate uh, uh, research studies that were, uh, that were, they were centered around looking at the, the sources uh, and the formation of SOA uh, and, and the corresponding oxidation products uh, in, uh, through research collaborations in China. And I think a lot of the same questions hold true in India as well. Um, an obvious question that I motivated um, uh, Earlier in this talk, by asking what are the precursors to SOA, is um, what fraction of SOA that's observed uh, in situ from oxidation of precursors uh, in damiate air can be explained by ox the oxidate the consumption of VOCs that are explicitly measured, uh, and so uh, that can be done by coupling the OFR to um, a, a PTRMS such as our Vocus uh, or any other instrument that is uh, is able to measure in real time. Uh, gas phase compounds that might be reactive towards hydroxyl radicals uh, and that might form SOA. Um, it's, all, it's also a logical question to ask what the gas and particle phase products uh, are that are observed from the OFR as it perturbs ambient air um, as measured with an instrument like the VOCUS or another gas phase analyzer and like the AMS or an ACSM or another uh, instrument that's capable of real-time condensed phase uh, uh, measurements, um, and more, and perhaps to the point of this talk, are they also observed in aged air masses, um, such that the the OFR is able to provide insight into what into into the how the composition of ambient air changes uh, as it's aged in the atmosphere. 
through direct perturbations of the air um, at the measurement location itself. Um, so I'm going to show a couple of, of applications using the OFR to, to try to get at some of these questions in certain source regions around the world. Um, here is a time series of aerosol mass concentrations measured with an ACSM uh, in a traffic tunnel uh, in the US. Uh, and this, these measurements were made by Tachik et al. Uh, and during an afternoon rush hour period in the tunnel. The, here, the OFR was situated in the top four of the tunnel right above the traffic. Uh, so we're sampling uh, emissions in real time from, from the, the car going through, and then we're aging them in the OFR and getting a semi real time indication of the SOA formation potential uh, of, of the vehicles that are the mixed vehicle fleet that's going through. Uh, and so during this afternoon rush hour period, we sampled uh, periods ranging from uh, just a dark OFR with, with no aging to stepping up the lamp concentrations and uh, going from hours to multiple days of equivalent aging uh, uh, within a few minutes residence time of the OFR. And you can see that uh, without aging, when we're close to sources, uh, we have you know, typical primary organic concentrations in the range of maybe five to 10 microgram per cubic meter or so, uh, significantly less in, in the way of inorganics. Uh, but then as we age the, the motor vehicle emissions, uh, you start to see uh, during these white periods, which represent when we're sampling through the OFR, uh, significant uh, concentrations of, uh, of nitrate uh, and ammonia, aerosol, as well as organics. Uh, so not only are we forming uh, significant amounts of SOA, up to 40 microgram per cubic meter or so at, the, at, the, uh, at multiple days of equivalent uh, OH exposure in the OFR, we're also forming significant inorganic ammonium nitrate as well. Uh, in this case, our interpretation of that, that trend is the fact that when we're in a tunnel, there are high NOx concentrations and there are high ammonia concentrations as well. And so the NOx uh, gets oxidized to nitric acid and the nitric acid then gets uh, neutralized by the ammonia to make ammonium nitrate. So this has been my experience using OFRs in different uh, source regions. You oftentimes will see something that you expect and oftentimes you'll see something that makes sense afterwards, but you didn't necessarily think about at the beginning as being a potential factor. Uh, and here, the, that was uh, the, the fact that we observed even more inorganic aerosols than organics when we sampled uh, ambient air to the OFR. That was because of the high NOx and the ammonia that were specific to the tunnel here. Uh, and then a, a conceptually similar study uh, was done more recently by uh, Liao et al. Uh, in Beijing where they installed their PAM OFR on the, um, the mobile laboratory. And this is a, a research group at Peking University. Uh, and they had on this mobile lab, a suite of, of real-time instrumentation, including uh, their TOF ACSM, and they had um, a PTRMS, uh, which could, uh, which a VOCUS would serve a similar, but better purpose, uh, to be honest, but um, that was what they had, uh, to, to gain insight into the specific VOCs that are responsible uh, for observed uh, SOA formation. Uh, so they drove around on the fourth ring road in Beijing, uh, measured uh, uh, significant in, uh, organic aerosol formation through the OFR, uh, ranging from tens of microgram per cubic meter to, to over 100 microgram per cubic meter during a haze event. Um, and with their PTRMS, uh, they measured specific classes of VOCs and from application of laboratory uh, SOA yields for those specific precursors attempted to explain as much of the, the observed OA formation that they could. Uh, and you can see that for the most part, uh, the, the largest fraction that they can explain is from single ring aromatics like toluene or xylenes, which you'd expect to be uh, present in relatively high concentrations when they're on the road. Uh, but still, that never explains more than a really small fraction of the observed uh, OA uh, that they saw when sampling through the OFR. Uh, and so the interpretation that, th that they posed was that the remaining SOA that was formed was from unmeasured uh, lower volatility uh, precursors to SOA, uh, like intermediate volatility compounds and semi-volatile organic compounds um, that are harder to measure, but who have uh, very efficient, very high SOA yields um, that are emitted from, from uh, the mixed fleet of, of vehicles that are on the road in this, in this study. And that was likely also the case for this study by Patrick et al, that, that IVOCs and SVOCs are the main uh, contributors to SOA formation uh, here. And you wouldn't necessarily 
know this until you made the measurement in situ, and that's where OFRs can provide significant value compared to chambers, which you can't take into the field uh, to measure in the same way. Uh, and so here, here again is another uh, study using an OFR coupled to um, this time in a uh, Aerodyne's AMS um, at the Calnex during the Calnex campaign that took place at Pasadena uh, in, in 2010. And so this is a receptor site that's a, that's uh, several hours downwind of the Los Angeles uh, metropolitan area in California in the U.S. Uh, and the same general trend is observed. Um, you see a maximum. Uh, aerosol enhancement formed after a few equivalent days uh, of OH exposure uh, before it then decreases due to continued fragmentation. Uh, but just here noting that when you're not, I, I just wanted to make the, the comment that when you're uh, not as close to sources, uh, the absolute enhancements uh, while there and while real are significantly less because concentrations of precursors in the air are much less. Um, during the daytime, when uh, VOCs, uh, IVOCs, and SVOCs have already been processed in transit from Los Angeles to Pasadena, there's less remaining at the site for continued oxidation, and that's why concentrations are relatively low here. Uh, but then at night, when there's less uh, atmospheric aging, uh, and when the mixing layer is, is also lower in the atmosphere, there's on average higher concentrations of VOCs at the site, and so there's higher SOA formation potential from OX, OH oxidation of those, those same precursors uh, when, when measured at the night time and set. Uh, and so this is one of, of many examples now where OFRs have been used uh, at different receptor sites around the world uh, to gain insight into uh, the precursors to, to SOA formation and the SOA formation potential at given uh, measurement locations. Um, so now to switch gears and talk about um, uh, some other slightly different uh, applications uh, and answer the question, what can be learned about SOA properties using OFRs? Here, I'm gonna show some examples, uh, example applications using the OFR in an analogous manner to an environmental chamber, uh, just as, as a source of uh, different types of, of SOA, uh, where measurements were made to learn more about their, their yields and their composition over multiple generations of aging. Um, uh, but then other, other logical questions to ask from these types of applications are um, what precursors are necessary to explain ambient SOA formation? So for example, if, uh, if a group has made ambient measurements uh, with an OFR in situ and seen uh, some sort of chemical fingerprint in the SOA or some uh, estimated yield, they will often then take the OFR back into the lab and look at the oxidation of precursors that they think may be needed uh, to explain that SOA formation. So in, in this sense, the OFR serves as a bridge from the, from the field to the lab. Uh, but then in other cases, uh, it may be of interest, as I said, just to use it in a similar way as a smog chamber, to look at uh, the properties of SOA, such as their, their water uptake or their light absorption efficiency, um, and how they change with aging. Uh, and, and are they correlated in any way that can be parameterized in models? Uh, first, uh, this, this figure is a result from uh, a study by Karjalainen et al, where they looked at in particle emission factors from a diesel engine, and they were specifically interested in looking at different engine aftertreatments uh, on that diesel engine and how that influenced both the primary and the secondary uh, organic aerosol emission factors. Uh, and so you, you can see where this might have implications for, for policy and regulations uh, in this type of study that if the primary component is what's, is what's regulated, but the gases emissions are what govern most of the aerosol that's formed in the atmosphere, this is where an OFR can be useful as a screening tool to gain insight into those questions. Um, and Karjalan et al. saw that uh, when they didn't apply any engine after treatment, they saw uh, PM primary emission factors of about five milligrams per kilowatt hour of vehicle operation, but then a five-fold increase in secondary uh, emission fact aerosol emission factors relative to primary that would have that would otherwise not have been known. Um, they saw a similar picture with uh, renewable fuel instead of fossil fuel, and then applying different oxidation catalysts uh, and other techniques to remove. Uh, primary aerosol, they had different uh, levels of, 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 um, of effect on the secondary emissions as well. So going from uh, you know, very high emissions to very low emissions, both primary and secondary, using specific 
combinations of, of engine after treatments uh, and uh, for different fuels. Uh, and there have been other studies in the literature that have also looked at uh, these types of questions, but for different engines uh, and also for other combustion sources, uh, such as, such as uh, wood fires uh, and even single vehicles uh, on dynamometer studies. Uh, so this is a very common application of OFRs. Um, they have been, especially now, uh, OFRs are continuously being used more and more to look at the aging of, of, of biomass burning aerosols. Uh, and this is an example of using uh, the OFR to, to age uh, tar balls that are emitted from a combustion source in Dr. Chakrabarty's group uh, at WashU St. Louis. Um, this was published in ESNT letters a few years ago. Uh, and what they saw was that when they generate uh, uh, combustion aerosols containing tar balls uh, that was absorbing already, this brown carbon, um, as they age it further, that both the imaginary component of the refractive index, which is proportional to its light absorption efficiency, uh, decreases at the wavelengths that were measured with their optical technique. Uh, and then the single scattering albedo increased uh, as you would expect when the absorption decreased. So the aerosol, the brown carbon aerosol in this case is being uh, bleached by uh, hydroxyl radical uh, as it breaks up the aromaticity uh, and the other uh, chromophoric functional groups uh, that are present in the primer primary brown carbon. Uh, and there have been a lot of studies uh, uh, that, have, that have accomplished similar objectives uh, using OFRs in this, in this, in this framework. Um, and now that we are now developing techniques to, to generate nitrate radicals, uh, similar studies are being done to look at the effect of nitrite time aging on, on tar balls, which as it turns out has a different, has the different effect. That adds nitrogen containing chromophores uh, through the nitrate radical oxidation that tends to uh, increase the absorption of the aerosol. Uh, a lot of groups have done uh, studies to measure the yields of SOA from different precursors of interest, uh, either motivated by field measurements or just motivated by uh, the current state of the science and open research questions. Here is an example using um, uh, an OFR to, to age to oxidize decamethyl pentyl siloxane or, or D5, which is a volatile chemical product that's used in personal care products and, and other anthropogenic sources. And you can see that um, as a function of of oxidation expo oxygen exposure and um, precursor concentration, you can approach relatively high mass yields with this precursor. Uh, and many other similar uh, studies have been, conceptually similar studies have been done with OFRs. Uh, and then um, here's an example of using an OFR to generate SOA with a range of composition to look at the hygroscopic properties. Uh, this study by Pajanoja et al. Uh, generated biogenic SOA from OH oxidation of isoprene, alpha pinene, and longifolene, uh, which have a range of different molecular weights and oxygen to carbon ratios, and saw that in general, uh, when um, the the less the the more oxidized lower molecular weight SOA had the highest hygroscopic growth factors, approaching 1.4 at the highest humidity that were studied, um, and then when you calculate the kappa values uh, from these different SOA types. The kappa values of isoprene SOA uh, measured in the subsaturated uh, regime approach what was made with the CCN instrument at supersaturated regime, but that for other uh, amorphous semi-solid high molecular weight uh, SOA materials like longifolene in particular, which is a sesquiterpene, there's a disconnect between the kappa value that was calculated from sub from subsaturated conditions to what was measured in supersaturated conditions. Um, so again, many groups have used uh, OFRs uh, in this sort of application. Uh, and then at the time that I originally made this slide if, uh, a couple of years ago, this study by Chowdhury et al. was one of the only studies that looked at the toxicity of SOA, uh, but there have since been a few more. Uh, and this generally, this just shows that um, SOA with different compositions in terms of the amount of aging, whether it's relatively uh, le less oxidation or, or more, can change significantly the toxicity of the SOA as measured by, in this study, the cell viability. So the less viable the cells are, the more uh, following exposure, particularly at these higher mass, uh, these higher sample masses of SOA, um, the less viable the, the cells are, the more toxic the SOA is. Uh, and that was observed for both uh, biogenic SOA and also anthropogenic SOA. Uh, so to summarize the main points from this talk, um, OFRs uh, are, are being used routinely in the community now to look at 
uh, and gain better understanding into OVOC and SOA formation and aging, both in the lab and in the field. Um, it seems to be the case that uh, perturbations uh, of ambient air in situ with OFRs can, in some cases, aid significantly to the interpretation of precursors to OVOCs and SOA in the air that can then be followed up with targeted lab studies, as well as to aid in the interpretation of, of factor analysis of those ambient source factors uh, using PMF and uh, other types of principal component analyses. Um, and, and I would make the argument that um, there have been enough in the, uh, enough applications and enough, enough demonstrations of OFRs to this point that it seems clear to me that they, they can complement and extend what can be done with traditional conventional environmental chambers, uh, but usually at much lower cost. For a while, there was some contention in the community as to whether OFRs are, are better or worse than chambers. Um, and I've joined different sides of that debate. Um, and But at this point, I just I, th I think it's a fair statement to say that rather than necessarily competing with them, uh, they can extend what they do and they can complement what they do, and uh, especially in cases where chambers are just not uh, a viable option uh, to deploy, uh, such as in the field uh, or in lab studies with limited space or limited personnel or budget. Uh, so I just want to close the presentation um, by just highlighting uh, a few resources online. Uh, on, on a wiki that I maintain, we have a, an active list of publications uh, for groups using OFRs. Uh, and all of the studies that I cited uh, over the course of this presentation are, are tabulated in the wiki. Uh, we have an electronic manual that has some of the more uh, detailed information about the PAM OFR itself. Um, we have a users list. Um, and I just did want to briefly mention Tescorn here. Um, so we've, we've, I've worked with a few distributors over the years to deliver OFRs to, to user groups. Uh, and for the most part, those groups uh, because the PAM is still a relatively new instrument, and those distributors have not achieved, have not had uh, formal training on it, they, mostly what they will do is they'll deliver it to lab, they'll open the box, they'll plug in the cables, and then just demonstrate it that it basically turns on, and then leave. I was really impressed when we delivered a PAM to IIT Del Delhi that that Tescorn went the extra step to to learn how to use the instrument and to work with the user uh, to do an OH exposure calibration. Um, before they considered their job done. So I think that if you decide that this, uh, this OFR, that OFRs are right for your group, um, I think you'll be in good hands between support from myself uh, and also from on the ground and from Tesquare. Um, so finally, uh, thank you all for joining me again. It's been my pleasure to talk to you about our work and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Andrew. Uh, it was a nice presentation with you, know, you have covered a lot of uh, case studies. Um, we have now a couple of questions. I'll just read out one by one. So the first one is, what are the effect of humidity and temperature on formation of SOA? It's a good question. Um, the, effect, the effect of humidity uh, is, it's, the first thing to realize is that with an OFR, when you change the humidity, uh, you also change significantly the OH concentration as well. Um, so uh, in order to, to target the effect of humidity specifically on SOA formation, you have to be able to use the estimation equation that I developed or the model to decouple the effects of, of humidity on, on OH exposure from humidity. Uh, but that being said, um, processes Heterogeneous processes that are humidity dependent um, may in some cases be residence time limited and are harder to study directly in OFRs, but uh, otherwise, um, I think in most cases, humidity seems to, uh, you know, by, by, by making the aerosol less glassy, uh, uh, can, can change the rate, the, the rate at which um, materials diffuse through the bulk. Uh, and in some cases may lead to enhanced uh, SOA formation and in and others, uh, I guess, could, could if, it, if it suppresses oligomer formation, uh, might decrease the amount of SOA that's formed. Uh, temperature, in most cases, I think, will, will decrease the, uh, the SOA yield just because of the, the volatility. Uh, and so um, if one wants to, to systematically look at the effect of temperature, uh, I, it, it is more challenging to do that in OFRs because 
uh, we don't have active temperature control. It's just whatever the temperature, the ambient temperature is, um, and the lamps will increase the temperature by by a couple of degrees uh, centigrade uh, just from their normal operation. Mm -hmm. So, like, what happens in dusty, dust-dominated area? Like, will the concentration of SEO be high or low? Uh, was the question um, in a dust-dominated area? Will SOA uh, concentrations be higher or lower? Was that the question? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I know that um, that that tend that in the in the earlier days of OFRs, when most of our users were uh, were based in the U.S. and in Europe, um, dust events were not really on our minds, and that was what led to one of the most prominent OFR users in uh, in the in the field being um, you know, Professor Ho Jose Jimenez at, at Sea Boulder, even recommending that uh, groups take off the front plate of OFRs when they can, um, for for various technical reasons that I won't get into here. But they they argued that it was advantageous to take the front plate off uh, um, and just sample ambient air directly in without the front plate. Um, that isn't necessarily practical in other parts of the world where dust events. Uh, uh, could, are a major factor. Um, and I know that groups in China have, have struggled with this question, and I haven't heard anything specific yet in terms of uh, what happens to the SOA formation potential of ambient air when there's a lot of dust there also. Um, so I, that's a really good question, and I'm sorry I don't know how to answer it just yet, but I hope that with continued growth and, and use of OFRs in, um, in, in parts of Asia, especially where dust events are just a part of life, uh, that we can gain uh, new fundamental insight into that into that question. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the next question is also again on the humidity. So, what is the minimum humidity required to generate OH radicals inside the PAM chamber? Is it necessary to add extra water molecules if we are using PAM for ambient aerosol oxidation? That's a really good question. Uh, unless you're sampling in the R usually not necessary to add um, extra humidity for, for ambient uh, OFR measurements, because usually there's plenty of humidity uh, that's already there to, to generate OH. Um, so at a, at a typical ambient relative humidity of 40% of or even 30%, um, uh, up to 50, 60, 70, 80% RH uh, or even higher, plenty of OH, uh, excuse me, plenty of water vapor already to generate OH and you don't need to add more. Um, you can generate OH uh, at 1% relative humidity. It's just not very much. Um, uh, and there, the, the, the bigger risk is that the rate of photolysis uh, at 254 nanometers uh, can, can start to compete with the OH. Uh, but you can always generate OH if you have any humidity. It's just uh, a question of whether it's enough to, to, uh, to achieve as much aging as you want. But generally, 20, 30% RH on the low end is still plenty. Um, and, and because in most environments, there's much more humidity than that, there's, there, there's, there's no need to add more humidity. Um, I guess the only other case where it may be necessary to add humidity is if you're significantly diluting uh, the sample. And so that can sometimes be an issue when you're sampling directly the output from combustion sources like, uh, like diesel engines or, 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 fl or flames from a, from a, a controlled burn. Um, there, it can sometimes be useful to dilute what you're sampling that you don't overwhelm uh, not only the OFR, but the instruments uh, with a significant amount of secondary aerosols that you're generating. Uh, and, so with, and so most dilution air is not humidified uh, as it comes out of the gas bottle. And so that's the case where if you're diluting by five to one or 10 to one, uh, the sample flow, that's the case where you would want to humidify the, the, the dilution flow. Uh, but in, but for, for normal ambient measurements, I don't think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, another is question is on the uncertainties. Like, oh, any wall corrections are required, or how to quantify the associated uncertainties, and what would be the uncertainty levels in the um, So, I think the question might be, what are the? I, I think the question is, what are the wall losses of? What are the particle wall losses uh, in in yeah. OFRs? Um, if it, if that's not the case, uh, stop me and and address it differently. Um, there have been a couple of studies uh, that have explicitly characterized size-dependent uh, wall losses of, say, ammonium sulfate aerosols or, or, or black carbon particles through OFRs by introducing um, 
mono dispersed aerosols at the inlet of the OFR, and then using the CPC to measure the a particle counter to measure upstream and downstream concentrations, uh, and from there uh, inferring the particle wall loss as a function of, of size. Um, every experiment is different and every particle type is different, but in general, um, I think it is probably, a, I think it is a true statement that above 100 nanometers or so, wall losses are typically 10% or less um, through OFRs. Uh, smaller particles tend to be higher losses uh, because they're more diffuse. And so um, they can, they're, through, through uh, convection uh, and recirculation in the OFRs that sometimes that, that does happen just as a matter of fact when the lights are turned on and temperature gradients develop. Um, those losses of particles that are say 50 nanometers or so can be more on the order of 50%. But, um, but that is how groups typically will explicitly characterize it as putting in a monodispersed distribution of aerosols and then systematically varying the size uh, over the range of interest and then measuring the concentrations upstream and downstream. Uh, and to whoever asks that question, if you want specific examples of that uh, in the literature, if you, if you email me afterwards, I'll point you to some references that might give you a, uh, a better example of, of what the quantitative magnitude of those, those wall losses are. Mm -hmm. So what is the operational range for PAM in terms of uh, humidity and temperature? And how easy to control these parameters? Uh, in the, well, I guess, I guess um, for field measurements, uh, typically uh, if, if you start with the, the situation where there's enough humidity already, uh, you mostly would, would work with the humidity that, that's present in ambient air um, and not try to control it further. But if we were talking about a lab study where you are con actively controlling the humidity, um, the, the system comes with a Nafion humidifier uh, that when um, it's just used, uh, when it's just fed uh, room temperature water uh, and dry air is flowing through it, uh, a typical humidity could be depending on the flow rate of through it and the any any mixing or dilution with dry carrier gas can range is typically about fifty to sixty percent relative humidity uh, without doing anything. Um, if you wanted to get it lower, uh, typically users will add a second uh, dry dilution gas to mix with it and then uh, reduce it. So getting it lower than that is pretty easy. Getting it higher than that. Um, is not that much more involved, uh, but it just it requires some extra hardware that we don't normally deliver because normally the 50 to 60% humidity uh, generates a lot of OH. But if, if the humidity is a parameter that's of interest for other reasons, you can add more humidity by putting in, um, probably the, the, the most effective way to do this, uh, because I, I, I've, I've done this a few times where I've needed say 90% relative humidity, uh, is to, to install a heated recirculating water bath um, that recirculates heated water through the nafion uh, through the nafion membranes that increases the the diffusion of of water vapor into the sample stream significantly. And so, just to give you some approximate numbers, uh, if room temperature is maybe twenty two or twenty five C, uh, if water that's heated to maybe thirty thirty two C is recirculated through that nafion humidifier, can easily get ninety percent relative humidity. Uh, and I've done that a few times. Okay. Um, for temp I think the other the other part of that question is about temperature. I think um, that is a little bit harder to to manipulate directly um, for the reason I mentioned earlier that the lamps will um, tend to increase the, the temperature by a few degrees. Anyways, um, I don't think there would be anything stopping you from wrapping the OFR in heat tape uh, and and heating it to forty or fifty C if you really wanted to do that. Um, but that's not something that we uh, equip with it to do um, on its own. But because every experiment is different um, uh, and, and the, the OFR is modular enough and, and small enough that that can be done on a practical scale, um, that, that could be done if you, if you wanted to go, go higher than, say, 30C or 35C to, to, to look at specific um, SOA comp composition or yield at certain, at certain conditions. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, sulfuric acid was considered a major precursor in new particle formation. Does it also affect SOA formation? Uh, it, it does. There have been a couple of studies that have looked at um, the influence of having uh, sulfate seeds on SOA yields. 
Um, and there are, um, there are some cases where it can have, so, so this is, um, the answer that I'm about to give is maybe less uh, focused on specific uh, nu nucleation at very low concentrations, but at, um, under conditions where there are higher concentrations of particles and you get uh, condensation and growth of semi-volatiles on top of that. So I, I can't, um, from my own experience, I can't speak to directly to how sulfuric acid influences uh, cluster formation um, at relatively low particle concentrations. But I can say that when you have sulfuric acid seeds uh, in the OFRs, which by the way, are very easy to generate uh, by just adding SO2, um, there are cases where that can in enhance the yield significantly relative to, to cases where there's neutral seed or where there's no seed. Uh, and the, the most well-known system for that, that I'm aware of um, is isoprene SOA, which forms um, species that, that are, are taken up into the aerosol uh, from reactive uptake and that are, are whose who's, who's uptake is enhanced by acidic conditions like sulfuric acid. Um, but there are likely other systems out there that, um, that I'm just not aware of where, where, where sulfuric acid can play a role. Okay. Yeah, one last question. Uh, is it possible to perform aqueous phase reactions like sending atomized droplets? And uh, is it possible to collect the droplets, condensed liquids from the PAM reactor for further analysis? Uh, that's a topical question to ask because I, I had a, a conversation with a colleague uh, on Friday about whether aqueous phase chemistry can be done by sending in uh, droplets at high humidity. Um, and I think my answer to that question is, um, I don't see why it couldn't be done. Um, this user was asking about specifically about sustaining humidity at 95% relative humidity or something like that, I think. Um, and I don't think there's any reason why it couldn't be done, but it certainly has not been a focus of, of uh, other research groups to this point that I know of. Um, and so I just want to give the, the kind of caveat that I gave to the other user in this case, that it, it probably could be done, but it hasn't been done. And so that represents a uh, uh, potential um, area where there are major contributions that could be made because it hasn't been studied, but I just don't have a lot to go on uh, from direct experience yet. But, the, but no reason why I think it couldn't be done, it just may require some, some learning and optimization uh, in order to figure out how to do it optimally. Okay. Okay. So that will bring us to the end of the session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andrew, for your uh, uh, very detailed presentation. And uh, thank, I thank all the participants on behalf of uh, Tuscan Aerofluid Incorporated. So see you next time in the next webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.